So today's lecture uh, is going to be quite different from the other lectures I've given, and uh, it's going to be far more uh, empirical, no uh, equations, uh, I think. And uh, so uh, this thing doesn't. Is that going to work to do something? Okay, I don't know what this means, but let's see if that would make any difference. Okay, so um, yeah, so we're going to focus on uh, empirical finding in uh, uh, deep learning and, and how they complicate the task of uh, finding theories and uh, a theory of deep learning, which is somewhat, I think, the uh, part of the motivation behind uh, at least a good fraction of us maybe that are interested in, in doing. So maybe before, uh, yeah, and uh, this talk will be somewhat uh, opinionated and, um, and uh, so, um, yeah, so I hope there will be some uh, discussion and maybe if the discussion goes beyond it, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, I'm around here and I should uh, warn you guys that my child has started taking uh, Muay Thai uh, lessons and I started watching them around. So, uh, you know, <laughs> if it gets too heated, just be warned. <laughs> so, yeah, but yeah, yes, you might. Uh, you will not hit anybody who brings the bottle of wine. No, no, I will not. Be, uh, yes, I will uh, not, not hit anyone who uh, brings the bottle of wine. Uh, yeah, and you can criticize me all you, uh, uh, if you buy me wine, you can criticize my slides all you want. Um, okay, so, so maybe just even to ask before we go uh, to talk about theory of deep learning, what do we mean by a theory, uh, by a scientific theory? And um, there, there are several versions of theories that we could uh, consider. So one is, you know, a mechanistic theory. So basically we have some, something we uh, observe, some uh, experiments, and we give a causal mechanism that really completely uh, explains uh, why we see what we see and predict uh, and predict and also explains the, mecha the mechanism that uh, uh, this comes about. And the, the classical example is really, you know, classical mechanics. You really understand uh, exactly uh, why, um, I don't know, with that spring, uh, when you pull it, uh, you know, you, you get the, the precise motions that you get or what, uh, whatever you pull the pulley or, uh, or do whatever experiments you do in high school. Now, you can also have a theory that doesn't really try to explain uh, how uh, the mechanism, but tries to give predictions. So, um, you know, if, uh, I think uh, in uh, economics, for example, uh, they believe that, you know, they have theories that says, uh, you know, uh, if under equilibrium conditions, this and that will happen. They don't try necessarily to explain the mechanism by which people will arrive at an equilibrium. They don't know the precise, necessarily, dynamics or uh, exactly these things, and they definitely don't know it up to the atoms, etc. but they rather attempt to give kind of qualitative predictions of what will happen without explaining exactly how it will happen. And then sometimes you have uh, all sorts of things. I think it's really more of a spectrum. So some, uh, and sometimes you have something that is maybe in the middle where basically you have models which you can completely solve. And, uh, and then they are somewhat, hopefully, related to uh, the systems that you have in the real world. Uh, so you can make uh, uh, predictions. So for these models, that you have a mechanistic uh, explanations and a, a precise quantitative prediction. And for the things that these things are supposed to be model, then maybe the prediction would be a little bit less accurate. Maybe it'll only be qualitatively accurate. But uh, you know, this is, uh, of course, statistical mechanics, the spin glasses, etc. And, and a lot of other science uh, falls uh, maybe into this category. So you would try to find like a toy model, a solvable model, and, and, and hope that it captures. And, and generally, we could have like a, a, a spectrum of theories uh, from one range uh, to the other. So, so suppose we, we want to ask about the theory of deep learning and the mechanistic theory. So, so there is one advantage for deep learning uh, compared to uh, everything else, even you know, compared to uh, uh, even classical mechanics, is that the mechanism is fully specified. The code is right here. You know exactly what the system will do. You can rewind it and do it again, and, and um, you, you know exactly. There is no mystery in that sense. 
that uh, there, there is, uh, everything is measured, everything is precise, and uh, everything is reproducible. So it seems like, you know, this is, if, if anything should have a mechanistic theory, then that should be it. And uh, so you, you might be able to hope for theorems, you know, it's a, it's a mathematically, you know, this is a mathematical process. Uh, uh, and you might be able to, you know, to hope for theorems that uh, of the form that, you know, if some distribution has a nice property, then um, if you have a certain architecture and you train it uh, with the certain uh, parameters, then you'll achieve an error epsilon that depends on the various properties of, uh, you know, your uh, architecture and, uh, and, and number of samples, etc. And indeed, we do have sometimes uh, results like that. And, uh, or sometimes we, uh, you know, they are like, for example, Natty's talk uh, gave a bunch of things where you can prove COMs. They don't necessarily always give you error bound, but sometimes they give you these kind of nice things. Like say, you analyze gradient descent and you say it will reach a stationary point of some uh, objective on, and you, sometimes, you, know, you can sometimes these, prove these things. So that's the big advantage for a mechanistic theory and why we might, you know, want to have uh, a mechanistic theory, and uh, that, uh, in some sense, that's the gold standard. So why we might hope for this and also uh, expect to get it. But the reason why maybe there are some hurdles for you know mechanistic theories, this is basically what the rest of the talk is about. All sorts of things that make it diff more difficult for us to try to explain exactly what's going on. And so I'm going to talk about some uncomfortable empirical aspects of deep learning. And uncomfortable here, I should say, it's really in quotation marks because this is uncomfortable from the point of view of a, theor of a theorist that wants to prove theorems and wants to, uh, you know, solve deep learning. Uh, but uh, a lot of these empirical aspects are maybe exactly why deep learning is so successful, right? So the, the reason why, that why we don't have a, a theory of a parapsychology is because it's crap. It doesn't work. The reason that we don't have an empirical theory of a deep learning is because it's too good. It's, uh, you know, we, we, uh, and, and a lot of these things are not just side, uh, you know, corner edge cases that nobody cares about, but more about like really goes to the heart of why deep learning is actually so successful uh, beyond what may, maybe should have been reasonably expected. So uncomfortable is in the eyes of the beholder. And okay, so let's start with talking about, you know, the role of overparameterization. So by now, everyone is kind of uh, seen this type of uh, uh, curves to death, this various double descent uh, curves. So, you know, we used to, uh, in the old days, the st statisticians used to draw this uh, U-curve and th say there is a bias variance trade-off and you don't want to overparameterize. But uh, now we understand that actually overparameterization is good, and sometimes you know the more the better, and, and you know you throw more compute, uh, more uh, resources into your model, it's just better. And, and and yeah, there have been a lot of works on this. This is you know a figure from one of our paper, but there's been a lot of. Uh, uh, you know, work on this, and uh, but uh, let's try to think a little bit. So, 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 so maybe now we try to come up with mathematical theorems that explain how overparameterization is actually important, essential. The you know the magic, but is it really that important? So let's try to understand whether it actually matters. So there is this very nice wo work of uh, Nakiru and uh, Neshabu and Sedji, who uh, that they call the deep bootstrap. And they did this really uh, nice experiment. So they uh, created, uh, they took CIFAR-10 and they created a data set, which basically using synthetic uh, image generation, they call it CIFAR-5 million. It's basically 5 million samples of CIFAR-10, basically. So now you don't need to go multiple epochs on your data. You can just run it again and again, and uh, you know, you can, you can just do online gradient descent. So you can uh, basically run the same, uh, the same model uh, with uh, using a fresh uh, point every time. And uh, so, so here is a cartoon of what they found out. And uh, this is a cartoon that I drew, but I asked, uh, I shared this, this with Pritom and he said, this is an accurate depiction. And I'll also show you like two graphs from, from the paper if you don't believe me. Um, so uh, so, so what, uh, let's, let's look at what happens in the standard setting. We train for, uh, you know, 100 epochs uh, in, on C410. And it looks something like that, which is kind of what we usually see, right? We, uh, training error eventually goes to zero and a test error goes uh, slower and, and keeps improving also a little bit at, uh, even after training error uh, reaches zero. 
Right, that's not surprising. The surprising thing was what happened when they trained the exact same um, the, the, the exact same model, but now they gave it 5 million samples. So now they, uh, they basically they are not reusing samples. And the interesting thing is, uh, yes, yeah, so this, this is the, uh, when training uh, reaches zero, the interpolation threshold. So the interesting thing is when you do this thing, online learning, you, every time you get a fresh sample, then there is no notion of, there is no point of talking about training, there is uh, because you're just uh, taking a fresh sample every time, but uh, you can talk about test error. And up until this regime of the interpolation threshold, they actually, this model behave the same. And they have replicated it in several architectures and, and, and it seems to be you know, robust, which is kind of magical. Here, every sample is, uh, you repeat it 100 times and, uh, in the red line, and here in the green line, uh, you get 100 fresh sample instead. And you seem not to be losing from, uh, from it. Yes? So do, you know, did they do data augmentation here for their standard training? That's a good question, uh, and I think they did vanilla with no uh, data uh, augmentation. And to some extent, you can think of data. Uh, so, so the question is whether each one of those hundred epochs was exact same copy or hundred augmented version of the same copy. Right. And that's a good question, which I think they did vanilla, but I'll have to check. And and. But, but it's still kind of very surprising. You know, you, you, you got 100 times as many data. Up to this point, it didn't really matter. Um, uh, at this point, you kind of saturated your training data. You have learned what there is to learn about it. And at that point, they start to diverge. You know, the online mo model can, can do better. Yes? GD or SGD or what are the batch size? SGD. And um, I think it was standard batch sizes, but I don't remember uh, by heart the, like the, number, the numbers that they use. Like I don't think they, I think they use pretty you know, standard architecture and they, and they uh, standard hyperparameters and they tried it on various models. And maybe one way to try to think about it would be that, you know, here, suppose in the beginning, what are you doing? You're learning some very basic features like edge detector, uh, de detection, et cetera. Then you know you use this image to learn edge detection, but and and, and maybe late uh, and maybe at this point you're learning I don't know eyes. You might as well use the same image for the eyes as you use for the edge detection because it's not as if you're like mem memorizing uh, you know while you're doing edge detection you're not really memorizing the eyes so you're not really ruining your ability to reuse this image later uh, for uh, for uh, eyes or whatever. And um, to some extent maybe what uh, this kind of, uh, uh, so, so basically they diverge at the point of uh, you know, interpolation. Basically when the model capacity reaches the, uh, the number of samples or number of iterations uh, reaches the model capacity. And whether the iteration is um, you know, fresh samples or reused samples. And, uh, yeah, and these are the, you know, the, these are the, the data from their paper. So here they show this thing for like three different, um, you know, architectures. You see the, how they track each other uh, closely. And here they, want, they wanted to play with the point of interpolation. So they reduce the number, the train, the train size. So you would interpolate quicker. And you can see that the point where you interpolate was uh, basically, this is the point where basically the real model starts the, uh, more, more or less plateauing, while the ideal model, the one where you're doing uh, online learning, uh, keeps going down. The one that is, is yes? The one that, is, that has access to this online, which is the online STD, yes. does it have less parameters or what is? The same mo exact model. It's you said does over parameterization matter? Right, ah, okay, so, so in some sense, the, this one is not over-parameterized because it has, it has the same parameters, uh, but uh, it's not over-parameterized because you have uh, in infinitely many samples. So it's not over-parameterized. So what I want to say is that it's not so much about the ratio, it's not about, uh, the, about the models having, uh, it's not about the models having more parameters than the data, that's not the po point. The point is that the models have many parameters. It's, more, it's about the absolute value and not about the ratio. So it's not about over-parameterization in the sense that it doesn't, for the, the power of the model is, is not because it has, uh, you know, I don't remember how many, uh, you know, this is a cartoon anyway, but let's say ResNet 18, whatever, like 10 million or whatever the number. The power of the model is not because it has, 
uh, you know, 100 many parameters uh, as the as much as data points, the power of the model is because it has lots of parameters. The absolute, so basically it's determined by the absolute value of the, the absolute size of the model and not the relative compared to the data. So the over parameterization doesn't matter having many parameters, that's important. Is that, does this answer? Yeah, but over here you're also saying having access to many more samples is also is more important in some sense, right? So, so you see, up to here, it doesn't matter. So up to this point, they track each other exactly. Like they, they don't, they, 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 this one, the red one, we use the same, uh, uh, the same uh, parameters. And, uh, and by the way, in, in large language models, they, they usually are doing single epoch uh, training. So it's not as if like, so, so in some sense, we can try to, you know, talk about, uh, try to give, get, give a theory of over-parameterization, uh, over but it doesn't seem to be like the heart of why uh, things are successful. Isn't, isn't it just kind of the abuse of the word? Shouldn't we just call over-parameterization exactly what you are saying, that the, that the function, that, that there is some underlying function we want to learn, and the architecture with which we are learning, it is way more expressive than what would be needed to actually learn that function. Well, we don't know. But we don't know, right? Maybe, maybe it is needed, right? Maybe, maybe the architecture, we don't know what's the... Uh, this may be needed, but this right. does not translate it to comparing number of parameters to number of samples. This is just like some very right. naive proxy of what we mean. Right, so, so I, I would just say, uh, yeah, like the, if, if over parameterization you mean more parameters than samples, that's not necessarily important for the success of deep learning. Uh, and it seems it actually is not make a difference that much. In, uh, so, so in some sense, uh, from this point of view, if you wanted to uh, say, if you wanted to get better performance, what you want to do is in some sense, in this early, you want to uh, get the trust error faster or at least uh, in some, uh, get the train error slower. So you care really about uh, the, uh, the ratio between how much you improve on test versus how much you improve on train. Because you want to interpolate, uh, you know, you want to delay the point in which you interpolate. Uh, to, to, uh, the, the more you, you de kind of delay the point in which you interpolate, the generally the better you are. You'll, you'll keep tracking the online learning, and the, the of, and of course the or, or the faster you go down here. So either you either you go here down down faster, or you extend the time that you have. That's basically uh, how you could. Uh, that's the difference between say better model and worse models. And so, so yeah, so uh, it's, uh, and, and maybe in, in some sense that's also kind of tells us that uh, like uh, regardless of whether we are online or if, uh, we are online or doing uh, actual or doing, uh, you know, uh, whether we are online or uh, doing multi-epochs, there is, uh, we probably shouldn't stop between, uh, until we reach this kind of point, so we shouldn't stop before the number of steps we take is roughly the capacity of the model. Maybe we, we should go more, but we, should, uh, we shouldn't go less. And, uh, and we'll come back to it later. So there maybe another way to say it is maybe there is no point in having a model. Say so if you are going to, uh, to, to process, uh, you know, at most one million, uh, at most one, one million uh, points, say, um, you know, if the, if the number of points you're going to process is at most one million, maybe there is no point in your model having much more parameters than one million. You're wasting capacity because you you could have continued to train for long, for longer and probably be uh, be getting better. So, um, uh, part of the story there change if you make the model bigger. So if you make the model uh, right, so. If you make the model bigger, in in this case, then in in this case there is kind of no like at this point if you had if you don't have more data at this point maybe there is no like making the model bigger by itself will not necessarily help. Sometimes maybe bigger models do like could 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 go down here, but but there is a certain point where you kind of plateaued, you maximize the the amount of data that you can use and. You know, a bigger a bigger model will have like uh, diminishing returns, but you uh, but you definitely like one of the uh, I think methods uh, one of the lessons here is that you if you have a bigger model you should also train it for longer time uh, because 
you want to, uh, there, there is no, no point in, uh, yeah, like in stopping before you kind of reach model capacity, if you're using it properly. So um, there is another uh, kind of challenge to, uh, um, yes, so, let, so, so <laughs> let's say, say uh, so, uh, so, so another challenge to kind of mechanistic explanation of deep learning is that if you add the mechanism, it seems that the mechanism, like if you explain that whenever you do uh, write uh, WT uh, equals WT minus one minus uh, eta times the gradient of the loss, that if, if you somehow explain things in this way, then it seems that if you radically change the loss, something should radically change. But somehow neural networks, sometimes you can radically change the loss and they still seem to do the same, same thing. So, uh, you know, this is the Anna uh, Karenina, the first sentence of Anna Karenina. Uh, it's, uh, you know, all happy families are uh, alike, but uh, an unhappy family is unhappy after its own fashion. So, um, and um, so you can see that, uh, you know, you might prefer to live in, in, in a happy family, but probably prefer to read a book about an unhappy family. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Yes. Is this not like a feature rather than a bug of a mechanistic, like, you know, it, like some mechanistic explanations might go via universality of some kind. Yes. Then, you know, it doesn't really matter which distribution, as long as your loss is in some big family, then, the, you know, yeah. so, like... So it could be, I mean, let, let's just say the following thing, like a, a theory would have to explain if, if it's still tied to what the loss function does, and, and, and it could be very radically different, as we'll see, it, it, then, then it will be a problem. But yeah, maybe you could have a mechanistic uh, that has this feature. So basically what I mean by neural networks is that they, you know, this deep learning system, system sometimes you, uh, you know, you change this eta parameter by a similarly small factor, suddenly everything breaks and goes to hell, but you go and change this loss from, a, say, a supervised loss to a self-supervised loss, which is like a very, very different, you know, one is like, a, you know, you're doing label accuracy, the other thing, you do the things that Jan was talking about, and it seems like very, very different, and yet uh, you, uh, you seem to end up in a similar way. We've seen it in, uh, in, in Jan's talk. So, so one way to think about it is that sometimes, like some aspects in, the, in deep learning, they obey Murphy's law. Right? If something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Like you, and again, like in Jan's talk, if you uh, put an energy function and it can collapse, it will collapse. If you don't, set a, if you don't put, uh, actively prevent it from, being col from collapsing, then it will collapse. So some aspects, uh, work like that, and then some other aspects, they uh, look more like um, uh, Marley's law. Uh, you know, everything turns out okay, don't worry. Uh, you know, everything uh, just works out, and, uh, you know, and, 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 and uh, it's really strange because I don't know if we know sometimes to predict which aspect will go like that and which will go uh, like the other. So, uh, you know, it's... Um, if again you look at this example of say contrastive uh, loss that uh, Jan uh, spoke about, then um, this con uh, contrastive loss, uh, you know, if you if you knew they 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 have like a many of like I don't know ten uh, augmentations, blurring, etc., cropping. If you knew the augmentations, then it wouldn't be very hard to give a system that would uh, you know solve the contrastive loss problem in a very stupid way and would not, uh, you know, would not do anything useful except, you know, decode. Ah, it's blurry, I'll just uh, re-blur it and then figure out. Like, so it's could, it could be, you could potentially solve it in a very stupid way. But somehow that doesn't happen. It's not solving it in a stupid way, it's solving it in a way that's useful for us and, and, uh, and, and successful. But uh, the other thing, like, uh, you know, the energy being flat, no, that's it, it will do. So uh, sometimes it's really hard to understand when, when will the system behave like an adversary and when it be, will behave like your best friend that uh, you know knows what you mean even when you didn't exactly phrase what you wish for properly and then uh, yes um, the latter part of the statement i'm not sure if i understand or it seems a bit uh, slightly imprecise so for example one thing would be like you've probably seen deep ensembles or just ensembling different neural networks and that does get you better performance if the networks were learning very similar representations, you would not gain anything, right? No, no. So I mean, would say, you know, if, if you're successful, you learn similar representation. If you're more successful, you probably learn, a, a, you know, a better version of the same representation. And we'll talk about it. Uh, yeah, like, I, I have some experiments to show for that. And maybe that will make 
Right, so, so first of all, this is basically a slide that uh, Jan uh, has shown, so, uh, or more or less. So, so basically, you can have these very different losses. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and as he has mentioned, so you can have like, uh, you know, supervised loss and self-supervised. And again, like, don't forget about like the precise, uh, maybe this is, should, should be two to the E or whatever. Uh, this, this should have been like uh, two to the E and uh, here and there. Or maybe, yeah, E is like two today. So anyway, uh, so, so forget about the particular, uh, yeah, but, but generally you would have like a su supervised loss and a self-supervised loss, and you achieve very similar uh, performance. So, you know, you take, uh, th this is a result from Simpler. I should have put the, uh, the reference there, but uh, you, you take the same architecture, even, you know, self-supervised shines when you have lots of unlabeled data, but even if you kind of compare it head to head, in the case where you have data, you could basically train the supervised network and train the self-supervised and then put a linear head on top and uh, you will achieve similar performance. But you could say maybe we achieve this similar performance in very different ways and maybe, uh, so, uh, so let's ask that. So people have started to try to understand what um, deep networks actually do in the sense of uh, like what do they learn and uh, Chris Ola has done like nice, some nice works on uh, trying to visualize the various things that it learns in different layers. So one experiment we wanted to do is to understand whether uh, if you say le let's fix f some things and vary some others. So let's suppose you take the same architecture, the same data, but you change the loss function from a supervised to a self-supervised. Do we learn this similar representation? And the way we uh, looked at it is we used this method that was or, originally proposed by Lenk and Vedaldi called uh, stitching. And here is the idea. So we take a fully supervised model and we take a self-supervised model. And now uh, if they learn uh, rep uh, the same representation, then we could expect that uh, if we just took like say the first three layers of the self-supervised and stuck it, uh, uh, we, you know, took out the first three layers of the uh, supervised model and stuck in and replaced them with the first three layers of the self-supervised model, then, uh, then we would not lose in performance, right? If they learned, yes. Yeah, yes, exactly. That's the stitching part. Yes. So, so you're one, one step ahead of me. That, that will not work, even if you took two models that were like uh, trained in exactly the same way, but just with a different initialization, they would not fit just because of symmetry. And uh, in, in particular, like in, if they are convolutional networks, then uh, basically the, the, there is no, uh, every location is kind of its own location. So you might expect there is no symmetry there but there could be symmetry in the channel. So basically, we, we could have like a, up to, uh, say if we have six channels, up to a linear function uh, between the channels, an invertible linear, say, channel, uh, fun function between the channels, we could, I mean, they, even if they were identical, that could be uh, the same. So this is exactly what we do. We, we train, uh, so we take the, the first k layers, the last uh, d minus k layers, and we train this uh, linear, uh, one by one linear uh, convolution, so basically a map from the channels to the channels uh, on top of it. And this is a kind of a very low capacity uh, map, so this is, the magic is not in this training and we'll also show some sanity check with random networks to see that uh, the, the, uh, this training doesn't really make any difference. So the philosophy is the following, if performance doesn't uh, drop, no matter where you do this, then uh, they learn similar representations. So, so, that's, uh, so, so that's basically what we do, and let's, uh, let, let's try to, uh, to see what happens. Right, so we took like three self-supervised uh, networks, and we also took like a random, completely untrained network just to, uh, for a sanity check. So we compare the, you know, the 100% uh, supervised, versus the 100% self-supervised. So this is basically the fraction of layers from the self-supervised model. And we see what happens. Okay, so this is not, here, this is not performance, but this is rather the difference in performance from the baseline. So um, if, typically these models, the self-supervised do, do slightly uh, worse than the, do slightly worse 
than uh, the self-supervised. So this is the zero, zero percent means that basically this is as good as the original supervised model. So if you have 100 percent, uh, if you are 100 percent supervised, uh, you will be here at zero. And if you are 100 percent uh, self-supervised, depending on the particular model, you'll be somewhere here, like maybe two percent or three percent uh, uh, above zero. So this is basically how much are you worth from the uh, baseline of the supervised model. So a priori, I, I can imagine two hypotheses before looking at the data. One of them is if it's 100% compatible. Like if the representations are identical, then basically it would be, uh, you know, you, you start here, you end up here. So it will be basically a straight line. If they had identical uh, performance, it would be straight horizontal line. Here it will be slightly elevated because eventually you're going to get here. And, you know, if the representations were completely different, they reached the same point. So basically, this is kind of the Anna Karenina model. They reach, they're both happy. We know they're both happy because they both have the same global performance. But this basically says that they also reach it in a similar way. The non-Anna Karenina thing would be that they reach the same end goal. They both have, I don't know, 80% accuracy. But they do it in radically different ways so that when you try to combine these things, it kind of explodes. So you, in that case, you might expect that it will look something like this, right? That basically, um, you know, you, um, the, the more you, you mix the models, the more you mix two parts of models that don't like each other, the more uh, things will just be, uh, you know, the, the, the more they will just behave uh, very badly. Because, uh, you know, you're trying to, uh, to fit a layer that uh, expected edge detectors and you're giving it uh, eyes or whatever. Right, so, so these are the two a priori uh, possibilities, and then we run the experiment, and, 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 and it looks like this. So, um, so we also, um, right, so, so it looks like this. So basically, uh, this is where we basically just use the random vec network that is completely untrained. And uh, for a random network, obviously, it ends up way up here, and it just and it looks like you know it's completely junk. Like uh, so, that sh just shows that the stitching layer is not magic; it cannot by itself improve performance. But for these uh, networks, it's basically more or less a straight line from the beginning to the point where it goes a little bit higher. The, the worse these men, uh, these networks are in terms of like the gap in performance between them and the supervised model. So that's kind of a evidence for this uh, Anna Karenina principle. Yes. Yes, we also in the, also similar. Yes, yes. So we tried in both directions and uh, yes. And we also did uh, some other things. Uh, so if you look at the paper, so for example, we uh, tried to uh, combine the model where the earlier, they both say are, are supervised, or, but one model was trained with more data uh, than the other. So the, the uh, hypothesis is that it will have the same kind of the representation, but of higher quality. And that seems to be borne out. So if you take the model that is kind of worse, and you, like that was trained with less data, and you replace the first k layers of it with uh, things that come from the model that was trained with more data, and then you stitch them, you get an improvement in quality. So that kind of is the idea that this, high, uh, this model that was trained with more data, it learned the same similar type of representation, uh, uh, but just higher quality one. So it will be as useful, you know, or, or even slightly more useful to the, than the original one. So it's not that it kind of does, you know, so it learns something that the, the stupider model cannot even use because, you know, they're talking a different language. So that's a little bit harder to know how to stitch. We had like different width that we did try and we had like similar results with the, and we, we only did with CNNs because again like we've, but, but these are like a lot of things that I think are worth doing. Another thing, the, yes. the, the paper, they also say that uh, they have, they discovered different representations if they use transformers versus CNNs. So they show that if you train in a self-supervised manner, that their particular model they can it uncovers unsupervised segmentation in the image, and mm -hmm. it only works with transformers. So perhaps there is also uh, a yes. the architecture 
Yes, uh, although, you know, it's a good question to try to figure it out. Of course, it could be that it's just more harder to, uh, it's encoded a different way. It's very hard to say that some model doesn't contain something. And, and one of the nice, by the way, reasons why I think this teaching thing works better than some other measures of representation similarity is that, say, sometimes, you know, for, suppose that these uh, models at this layer uh, learn some function of the input that is not really relevant to, uh, to classification, but it's a different function here and here. So some standard model uh, ways of measuring represent representation similarity where you try to do, like take the top, uh, you know, you, you, you do like a, a, you know, a PCA of one and a PCA of the other and try to match them, then they, they could show that the representations are different but they're different in ways that in some sense are maybe not relevant. Maybe they're just noise and measuring the, the stitching penalty, I think, is a way to kind of cut out that part and show, you know, the real similarity. Anyway, uh, so that was, uh, yeah, any, any other questions about this? So, so let me now talk about um, toy models for deep learning. So basically, this is the idea of like try, let's try to think of a solvable model that we can understand, and then uh, and maybe make qualitative predictions that are uh, that could work. So that would be like a different than to say trying to fully explain in a mechanistic way what we actually do. So one such model that I think was talked about uh, here is can, uh, is this new and tangent kernel. And the nice thing about it is that it is, in some sense, a mechanistic model because it does correspond to neural networks, it, it just very, very wide ones. So in that sense, it is, uh, that's, that's a good thing that's, you know, going for it. The, the bad thing for going for it is that it's kind of, it's a kernel. And in some sense, a kernel is almost by kind of definition is a model that doesn't learn features. It's, the features are uh, in the kernel. So, uh, so, so it might not correspond to things that, you know, you couldn't do with kernels. And, and, and now another model, uh, which uh, I, I'm going to spend more time on in this uh, lecture, is this, the idea of k nearest neighbor. So the idea is that you are assuming that somehow under the hood, and you don't try to give a mechanistic explanation to how that happens, but you say somehow magically what happens is that when you train uh, data, uh, deep net, let's say, or the classification problem or regression problem, then um, you, uh, what really happens is that you somehow uh, learn a d-dimensional manifold and some uh, embedding of the xi's into this manifold. And how you learn it, we don't know. And, uh, and, we, uh, and we don't, um, we, and we, let's say, we, we don't try to do it, to explain it mechanistically. We just say, you know, suppose that under the hood, this is what happens, and somehow uh, you're learning a d-dimensional manifold, and somehow your uh, predictions end up being some combination of the k nearest neighbors in that manifold. Let's assume that some, uh, this is what happens under the hood, and, and see what kind of predictions would that give us about what we observed in uh, deep nets, and uh, whether these predictions uh, are borne out by actual deep nets. So again, this is very much like this manifold hypothesis, but I'm not trying to give anything mechanistic here. I'm just saying, like, you know, the network might have, like, uh, you know, the representation layer might be, I don't, I don't know, 10,000 uh, uh, neurons, and, uh, and, uh, and maybe, but somehow I believe that, uh, you know, it learned this embedding, and, some, and somehow it's doing nearest neighbor, even though explicitly it's not, that's not uh, what it's doing, but I just look, uh, imagine that this is what's really happening. Uh, in principle. And uh, by the way, if you have an interpolating classifier which has to output yi uh, for xi, then that would basically correspond to doing one nearest neighbor. That basically, uh, that's, uh, so for every new point, it takes its nearest neighbor and uh, say outputs the yi for that nearest neighbor. And uh, um, so for the training set, it will interpolate. Okay, so, so this is not a mechanistic necessarily, but you can still make you know, both qualitative and quantitative predictions, and you can try to see uh, if, if they uh, are borne out. And as we'll see, some of them are and some of them aren't. So it, some of these predictions have to be predicated on some kind of regularity assumptions on the manifold. Yes, so something that is kind of random or something like that, like things that are kind of uniformly well co uh, covered in the manifold or something like that, yes. 
So, so here is some prediction. So, here, uh, so suppose we train an interpolating classifier on the following thing. So, so think about the following uh, data. You, uh, you train uh, x is randomly in C for 10, but the label is not between 1 and 10, but rather it's either plus 1 or minus 1. And the probability that it's plus 1 is basically the class, uh, the uh, the, the class of x divided by 10, right? So it's, uh, you know, 1 tenth, et cetera here. I just said something. Uh, doesn't matter the minus and zero. But basically, it's the class of x divided by 10. So, and so, so uh, if you are trying to uh, minimize the prediction loss on the population, the, the right thing that you would do uh, is to, to uh, f of x should be, uh, you know, plus 1 if the class is larger than 5 and minus 1 if it's at most 5, right? The first five classes, it should output uh, minus 1 and uh, the, the other... Uh, in the other five classes, it should output plus, uh, plus one. That would be the thing that minimizes the population loss because uh, everything else would, uh, would be less, uh, you know, would be uh, in expectation, be worse. Right? So if, you are, uh, if you're going to get scored with an event that has 80% probability being uh, plus one, the best, your best guess for it is to say plus one. So, but uh, if you're doing, if we think that when interpolating classifier, what you're really doing is one nearest neighbor, then what will happen is that you'll actually be mimicking these probabilities. Because if you're going to get, say, a random, uh, I never remember the, the order of the classes, but let's say that, I don't know, cut is it three or four, whatever. Uh, let's say that cut is four. Uh, so uh, if you're getting a class, you know, a cut, uh, a, 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 a random cut, then what you're doing, you're doing a nearest neighbor. Suppose you are a good classifier at C for 10, it's not that hard. So you're taking a random thing, then the random neighbor would be a random cut. Uh, so you'll ba just basically be answering uh, plus one with the probability that you get, uh, that you would have gotten plus one with a, a, a random cut, so four over 10, for whatever it is. So the nearest, na uh, so if it's one nearest neighbors under the hood, then it would behave it would not be uh, doing the thing that uh, maximizes the, that minimizes the, popul the population loss, but rather it would have this behavior where the kind of conditional probability of the prediction uh, corresponds to the conditional probability of the, the conditional probability of the labels in the training set. So it would be mimicking the, the probability rather than minimizing the loss. And so uh, Pritum and Yamini, uh, to my, for, my, my former students, actually ran this experiment. Uh, so they, um, they, they uh, okay, so, so this is basically, uh, these are the, uh, the non-conditional probabilities. That's why they, uh, you know, they, they, are, they don't have up to one. Uh, but uh, so basically they ran this exact experiment. So they, uh, you know, they trained it when the, for planes, uh, it, the, for planes it always, uh, you know, are, uh, the, the planes always, are always zero, the automobiles got a label of uh, zero with 90% chance condition on being an uh, automobile, the, et cetera. So they trained in, in this thing, and then they, uh, they trained an interpolating classifier, and they uh, tested, and basically, um, it, you got the same. I mean, there's sli slight differences uh, here and there, but basically you got uh, the, the you got the same. Uh, the the test, the the way that uh, the classifier behaved on the test distribution is like the distribution in the train, while what it should have done if it was minimizing the loss would be to uh, basically give. A, to uh, to give zero to uh, all of these and to and give one to all of these. So so that's what it it really should have done. But uh, what it really uh, what it actually did was really mimic the probability distribution. So that's in some sense that says that uh, you know the classifier behaves more like a one nearest neighbor than uh, something that's really trying to minimize the the actual loss. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Basically, how is that related? Because when they recently showed that when you train in your network until uh, whatever, some, yes. some point of overfitting, 
uh, there is a simplex forming of these embeddings, mm -hmm. and de facto what the classifier does is nearest neighbor in some sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems not in contradiction, but what yes. is that? So, I mean, I guess this is, uh, I mean, they, they are kind of showing maybe, I mean, I don't know that work, but it might be basically a way where you're trying to show some kind of a mechanistic interpretation to explain why this would uh, happen, but uh, we, which I think is, you know, interesting. I am trying right now to see if, if it's reasonable to expect that this would happen, and some predictions, and at least this thing says, yes, that's reasonable. That's what we would expect. Uh, at least this is consistent with being a, uh, We've, we've doing uh, some kind of a nearest neighbor under the hood. And um, although I think that it doesn't necessarily have to collapse, like uh, you could have things that are, uh, yeah, in particular, you just note that in this experiment, the labels were either zero or one. So from the point of view of the classifier, that, that's actually maybe interesting and not, if it should have completely collapsed, it would have just collapsed to two classes, the zero class and the one class. And, and uh, it, it, you know, if, if it had really collapsed, but, it, but somehow, even though you didn't tell uh, the classifier, you didn't tell it, you didn't tell it that uh, you know a bird is different than an automobile. But it just kind of learned this because it knows how to distinguish between birds and automobiles. So somehow, the conditional probability distribution uh, is different. Uh, that uh, that he induced on the test is different in a bird and uh, an automobile, even though those labels were never given to it. Which is kind of uh, interesting. So, so it's uh, somehow discovered this structure in the data, and uh, so so this manifold wasn't co uh, completely degenerate in the sense that it's the manifold of just two things, just the zero and the one. It's it, it, it somehow de discover the, the richer manifold and, and of of you know different uh, di different types of images, even though that was not part of the labels that it was given. So, so do kernels exhibit this phenomenon, or is this feature learning? I, that's a good question, which I, uh, I mean, I think nearest neighbor to some extent is somewhat related to kernel. So I think if you had a very good kernel for, uh, you know, C410, then y y you can think of nearest neighbors as somewhat very extreme version of a kernel, right, where you, you, uh, you, things decay very rapidly, so you get only contribution from the things that you're nearest. So I think this should be also true in kernels, but uh, so I don't think this is, demonstrates any kind of necessarily uh, feature learning. Uh. Yes, I mean, especially if your kernel is singular, right? Yes. Yeah, so 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 I think it would be. Yeah, so so I think this is. Uh, yeah, so I don't think this this is feature learning. We'll see feature learning later. So another uh, prediction of this kind of nearest neighbor is that maybe uh, you know if the if what you're doing is really looking being based on the things that are very near to you in the training set, that there would be for every particular point x, there would be a very small set s of x of points in the training set that greatly influence where, what is the label that you'll eventually uh, uh, do and uh, give to f of x. And, uh, and in fact, if we think that this corresponds to the, some distance in some natural manifold, then we might think that uh, whether x influences x prime, uh, if, if x strongly influences x prime, then this would be something that will be some kind of a meaningful distance. We would look at these two images and we say, ah, oh, okay, they are like similar in some, uh, we would expect that in some natural manifold of images, where whatever that means, they would be close. So there's a very nice work by the, from the Madri group uh, called the data models, where they basically did something that is a little bit insane, but uh, I'm happy they did it. Where they, uh, I think they had to train uh, CIFAR like six million times uh, or something like that uh, to do it because basically for every particular point X, they uh, they trained uh, CIFAR on a large collection. Uh, I don't remember how large, a large connection of. Uh, so they trained like a large collection of. Uh, uh, so, so they had this kind of very large collection of training sets, and then uh, you know you have this large collection of points x1 till xn, and so they have these classifiers that were trained uh, in each one of those uh, training sets, and they try to understand uh, you know what's the probability that say you get xi wrong um, uh, as as a function of the things that were present in the in the training set. So using that, they're trying to kind of get like the, how well correlated. Like so, you have two images, 
how uh, much will the presence of one of them in the, in, in the training set positively or negatively uh, uh, correlate with the probability that you get uh, uh, the other one correct. So, uh, so one thing they saw that is that these correlations do kind of make sense. So say you look, you, you look at the, this plane and you want to ask what are the other things that, that their presence in the data set will most increase the probability that you get this correct and what are the things that their presence in the data set will decrease the probability that it's correct. And in some sense, it kind of makes sense, right? Planes, <laughs> like, if you get all of th these things and with a label plane, it's maybe not surprising that you also look at this and then you say this is also a plane. And also, this is not surprising that this will be negatively correlated. Like, if you saw this image and you got a label, a horse, then, um, you know, the, uh, it may be more like, it, it increases the chance that, uh, you know, this, uh, that when you put this plane uh, in and you take the nearest neighbor, you'll actually find this guy and then you'll say it's a horse rather than a plane. So, um, so you kind of see that uh, these, uh, so, so similarly, you see basically that uh, uh, the, these having a strong correlation is, uh, um, so, so it kind of makes sense that if, like, the if the algorithm is really doing kind of nearest neighbor under the hood, then maybe you'd expect these type of things to happen, where like the, the presence of these things will be, uh, you know, strongly correlated, or you know, st um, it's it becomes much more that the nearest neighbors uh, will be uh, will be here positively uh, labeled correctly or labeled incorrectly for that particular point, and they also like. Yeah, I guess it depends on how, you know, uh, yeah, I guess it depends on, like, how generally you, you think, like, you, you know, for example, uh, potentially, uh, say, you know, a human, uh, yeah, it's like humans think very differently, I guess, uh, they, maybe they, uh, they, you know, it's, it's very hard to say, well, like, how do we label a uh, plane? We, we don't really keep, like, a database of, like, the things that we have seen and <laughs> we're labeled pl plane or not. Yeah. So... What is your alternative to nearest neighbor? I mean, another way that neural, neural nets would work and that would be validated by this data. Yeah, so, 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 for example, you could have imagined that, if, for example, in the previous thing, you could have imagined that a, a neural network would have actually gotten the, the right loss minimizer, right? If, that, uh, you know, you could... Uh, you could have imagined if it was kind of a Bayesian agent, then it might have done the, the yes. Yeah, so, but I guess I, I'm here mostly in, in, at this point, I don't know if I have a good uh, alternative hypothesis. I just point out that things are like, uh, and even the nearest neighbors is not really perfect. I will, we will see. So, so we, the, the, I'm just saying the, these are the kind of things we have to contend with in all sorts of uh, alternatives. Because you, you could imagine like another kind of process where basically you think of neural networks as doing something Bayesian or something like that. and. and Yes. Uh, just a question on nearest neighbor again. Is yeah. you, so it is not on the input space, I guess, right? Like, do, do you think it, think of it like, oh, it improves like the specification as you go across layers, or uh, so, so what is the data manifold that we are? We don't know, right? We we don't know, but we, we think it's kind of pretty low dimensional, and it's kind of it's semantic. It's somewhat sem supposed to be semantic. It's not like pixels, right? And these. Uh, and these images, they're not, uh, you know, necessarily uh, like, you know, they, 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 you know, they're not necessarily like they could be, you know, this cut and this cut uh, are actually like not that, uh, you know. Uh, so there is color mismatch. So there yes, there is color mismatch, and also like the the particular pixels are not the same, right? So it's more like this is yes up to some translation. Uh, but you, you kind of thought that this is like a blob of, well, I guess CIFAR images are like that. Like it's like a block, blob of black, uh, black and white, and uh, it looks like, uh, you know, then, then it's probably a cut, uh, right? Because uh, that's what cuts look like. So, um, yeah, but, um, yeah, but this manifold is kind of in a smaller dimension and, and implicit. We don't know what it is. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the dimension in a second. And another kind of prediction if you, that, that if you're kind of doing the k-nearest neighbors is that you'll be very sensitive to, uh, and, and, uh, you, you'll be very sensitive to uh, a few points in the data. And they, they show that, uh, they, they show that basically, 
um, by flipping the labels of, you know, fewer than, uh, yeah, like something like, I think, 30 points. Uh, if I remember, like, uh, so, so basically for every point in, uh, for almost all, for almost all points in uh, CIFAR 10, there exist fewer than 30 uh, data points uh, that uh, if you were to flip their labels, uh, you would uh, cause the uh, algorithm to mismatch, to mislabel, uh, to, uh, to, to mislabel the, the result, uh, the, the input. And this is, of course, the kind of an upper bound. Like, they, you, can, you could not show that there are even a better set of points, but, you know, you cannot do an exhaustive search on, on pos all, all sets of points, but their, their methods enable them to find, like, really very... Uh, so this is, if, if you want to change, uh, if, you, if you just simply draw points from the data set, it's, you need to drop more. But if you mislabel, you can really, very few uh, points you could mislabel and uh, cause the result to, misla to be mislabeled. But that's selecting adversarially, right? What? It's, you're selecting points adversarially, right? Not at random. Adversarially. This is completely adversarially, yes. Basically, you are t selecting, the, based on their correlations, they're taking the, the points with the top correlation with that point. And just uh, you know, flipping them and and and. and uh, but if you have a KNN hypothesis, then even just randomly flipping, let's say, more than a majority should be like. No, that's very definitely. For if you randomly flip, that, that's actually also observed. Like generally, if you t if you add epsilon noise, you'll decrease like you uh, you you by epsilon. But notice, this is just you thirty. You have a data set of fifty thousand points. And you just change like 30 uh, and, and you, you, and you uh, so, so this is more like that you found these nearest, these points that are very likely to cover the nearest neighborhood and, uh, and, you, point, uh, and you flip them and now uh, this guy is doomed. So, so here is kind of uh, some other prediction. Uh, basically, if you have uh, right, if you have an epsilon ball in dimension d, then its measure is kind of scales like epsilon to the d. So, roughly speaking, if you uh, if you are in a d-dimensional uh, manifold, you kind of need epsilon to the minus d uh, points to ensure that the, the, the nearest neighbor would typically be of distance epsilon to you. So. Uh, if, if you think of your error scaling as uh, epsilon squared, then uh, you would get like something like, uh, I think, epsilon to the minus uh, two over d scaling law for errors with, uh, with samples. And generally, this is like the exact, generally, you'd, you'd expect some F, uh, n to the minus c over d uh, kind of uh, law, and it might depend a little bit of the smoothness, et cetera, of your, uh, of your error and of your predictor. And some, uh, so, so there is this, uh, okay, maybe I'll, uh, I'll say it in a second. There, there are, people have looked at it and claim that a lot of the time it's n to the minus 4 over d, but, and they claim to have, uh, yeah, I, uh, is there someone here? Uh, yes. So, so uh, I don't know how principal that 4 is. Not very, right? We think it's like a leading order chart, but you know, it has higher order chart. Yes. Yeah, so, so, but n to the minus c over d, I think it's kind of safe. And, and this is like, and we actually do see these scaling laws, right? So, uh, so we do see these, uh, these scaling laws, which uh, in the particular, you know, data set, you kind of imagine that you need both the parameters and the data to grow, to store, if what you're doing is really uh, getting all these points and storing them somehow in your parameters, then uh, you kind of imagine that the, you'll need both of those to, uh, to grow. And they had like, you know, figured out some, uh, you know, exponents empirically, the people from, uh, uh, open AI and uh, also Shlomo Rosenfeld did it for vision data. So you have these scaling laws, which also, uh, so, so there is, which also kind of seems to work well with the idea of this kind of manifold hypothesis. Uh, and 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 Yasaman uh, have the, like very nice paper where they t uh, you know both uh, try, try to give a kind of theory, and I think it's uh, I think it's related to this. Other paper by some of the authors like uh, Sharma and Kaplan, where basically they say they try to find, uh, you know, uh, measure the dimension of the intrinsic, intrinsic dimension of this manifold, which I think is always very tricky to try to measure dimensions of intrinsic manifolds. So it's it's hard a little bit to know exactly, but but they say it's more or less kind of scales like maybe four over alpha and. Uh, 
in the in, yeah in, in the in in, in Yasaman's work they they study uh, I don't know if are you going to talk about it no so they they studied uh, all sorts of you know you you can try try to think of all of these resources like uh, uh, data set size uh, model size uh, etc and try to um, total compute and, and try to study them separately yes. That's the claim, yes. The, the claim is something like that. It would be something like 2 to the minus d. And now, like the, some issues with these kind of predictions uh, are the following. So for example, like if you look at the Kaplan et al., uh, uh, they kind of predict that the error would scale something like tokens to the minus alpha and the number of parameters. Uh, so tokens, I mean like the number of compute steps. Uh, like minus alpha and the parameters do minus beta for beta that is uh, smaller than alpha. Which kind of means that if you need to take, make the error half, you need to increase the tokens by 2 to the 1 over alpha and also the model by 2 to the 1 over beta, which basically you mean in the model to grow more. Uh, and eventually, if you kind of repeat this to infinity, you'll get the number of parameters to be larger than the number of tokens, which I think is somewhat unreasonable. Like number of tokens, I mean number of computational steps. So I, I, I see, I, like I said in the, uh, bootstrap paper, that my intuition is that this doesn't make sense for you to, if you have an, a, a model with n parameters, at least dense model with n parameters, my intuition is at least that it doesn't make sense to train it for fewer than n steps, because in some sense, uh, every time you, you do, uh, like, a, you process a token, you get maybe in some sense one scalar from this token. And um, if you, you only injected into your, uh, you know, the, your loss, like in some sense, you only, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like you probably are not gaining, in, like the model becomes too big. But, uh, and there is this claim also by this Chinchilla uh, paper that they say basically, if you look at these scaling approaches, they suggest that the model size should grow uh, much larger than the computation and they try to come up with their own ways to estimate and they claim that the, the model should kind of go, go with the computation that basically if you uh, double the model size, you also need to uh, you know, double your training time rather than uh, if you uh, double uh, the model size, you only need to increase the training time by say 1.5. And, uh, and, and they claim that you know, they, they show that maybe this actually does give some benefits. So they say basically use smaller models but train them longer. But, uh, so in any case, like the, maybe these prediction, but maybe again, that doesn't contradict the manifold hypothesis in any way or the nearest neighbor, it just mean maybe uh, you have to be a little bit careful in these uh, scaling laws. But here is something that maybe is a little bit more uh, complex. So if you are doing nearest neighbors on manifold, in general, it, it uh, if you think about the models that, you know, you just add more points to this manifold, then the model should be kind of monotone. In some sense, you'd think like, what does it, what does it mean that the model is better than a model, another model? It basically means that it has a more densely packed manifold, right? And uh, so, so in, in for every particular point, uh, on av you know, you'd expect that if you have a point and, and the, the more you pack it in the, in the manifold, the, the more likely would you, so it's not just on average you're supposed to be uh, better, not just on average that you're supposed to get better predictions, but also for every particular point. So, and that's somehow, some of it seems to make sense in the following, there was this very nice paper by uh, Miller et al. and Ludwig Schmidt, I think has done a lot of work on these things, where they show this phenomena that uh, models that are better, uh, you know, uh, in some sense, the, the being better is correlated, right? So you would like, you know, we would like the world to be just, and that, uh, you know, if uh, someone, uh, you know, uh, swims faster than me, then at least I'll be better than, uh, than them at math. But uh, unfortunately, sometimes it's correlated. The people that swim better, they're also better than math. They're better, you know, they're also taller, and, uh, you know, sometimes you just, like, uh, the world is not just. So something like that happens with these models. You know, the models that are better on ImageNet, they're also better on ImageNet V2. They're also like, you know, they're better on this CIFAR. They're also better on this. So, so there has been this kind of strong correlation where models are better uh, performing on one data set. They're also performing on another data set. So that kind of lends credence to this idea that basically this is all, uh, uh, you, you, you may be even point-wise monotone. But uh, we show that you can actually construct a data set 
uh, that uh, has the opposite behavior. So on this data set, uh, so in this is a reasonable data set, it's like, you know, it looks like CIFAR 10, uh, you know, the labels are uh, like our frogs are frogs, are, uh, whatever, our, uh, dogs are dogs. Uh, so, uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is one of the, uh, the top, I think, is the C410 and the bottom is ours, but they basically look the same. And in our model, uh, you know, increasing, you know, in our model, when you, uh, the models that, uh, you know, you, you take, we took a family of models uh, parameterized by training time, and the, mo the models that are better somehow uh, on C410 become much worse on C410 neg. So, uh, so somehow it's, uh, so, so and the reason is that you can find these kind of non-monotone points. This is not from CIFAR, this is from uh, ImageNet. But you have these more points. Here uh, what we're showing is we, we look at the uh, probabilities that, uh, the softmax probabilities that uh, the model uh, assigns to these, uh, these three things and all the rest as we, as we increase, uh, as we increase running time. So eventually, uh, you know, it realizes uh, that this is corn. But at some point, there is something interesting where the model, you know, get, uh, and uh, you know, the, the probability of uh, of getting corn correctly rises, but then, uh, but but then it somehow drops. So somehow uh, it gets confused. Uh, you know, some, somehow, somehow at this point, as the model is better uh, globally on ImageNet, but is worse on this particular point. And, um, and, and uh, there are, no, are actually, like this is statistic from ImageNet, there is actually a decent fraction of these non-monotone points. And uh, so uh, we measured with respect to, you know, ResNet uh, 18 and uh, ResNet uh, 121, and, and there are like decent fraction of these points that are non-monotone, where you, you get worse at some point. As you, as you get better globally, you get worse locally. Uh, but interestingly, if you pre-train the models, then, uh, then they all basically disappear. So in particular, uh, so, so in particular in this, if we look at the CIFAR 10 and we look at, uh, at pre-trained models, then they basically all uh, perform very nicely on this model. There, there is perfect correlation between how well they do on CIFAR 10 and how well they do on, uh, on, on the CIFAR 10 neg. These were probably ImageNet, but I don't remember. And how did you collect CIFAR 10 neg? So we took Scenic 10, uh, which is basically a larger data set that has like CIFAR 10 uh, things, and then we looked for these non-monotone points. I think it was a uh, thousand of them or 10,000. Now I have to... Uh, so the difference was in terms of the number of so non-monotone points in both the different sets? Yeah, so basically, you know, we have these 30% points that are non-monotone. We pick the most non-monotones, the ones that you could find. Like, so, so it's basically, it's a deliberately thing to collect the ones that are like most non-monotone. So but we, you know, we, we, they are non-monotone with respect to one model. They also turn out to be non-monotone with respect to the other. So they, they seem to be some, uh, yes. But they are in some sense more difficult points, right? They're not necessarily more difficult. Not all of them are necessarily more. We kind of ca did this characterization. Uh, so if you look at the paper, we, ca uh, you know, we try to do a taxonomy of the points that are simply hard. There are points where it's monotone but hard. Like, you, you know, you, it just takes longer. You, your model is, you know, the model has to be like, uh, you know, say 90% accurate on CIFAR, or, you know, before it starts getting like uh, accuracy, uh, high accuracy on these points. So there are points that are simply harder where, uh, you know, that could be basically where the, the, it's still a line, but for that particular point, maybe the line will have like a, a lower slope. So that would be just basically be a point that it's uh, harder, like, uh, and then uh, non-monotone could be different, you know, it's, uh, it's when the point has, uh, like when the line has a negative slope. Right, so generally the kind of things we were, like we were doing in this paper and we, uh, is we measure, we, we put on the x-axis the accuracy of this, of my model globally, on the y-axis say accuracy on a single point. And uh, so you can have like these easy points where accuracy climbs up faster, where the line has slope is larger than one, hard points the slope is smaller than one, or the derivative is smaller than one, and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's harder. The derivative is uh, larger than one that's easier. But, uh, the, you know, if the derivative becomes negative, that's kind of uh, non-monotone. Yes? So this uh, plot on the left where you have this non-monotone behavior, yes. is this 
like a single model that reaches different accuracy points? Or so it's like a, a ten. Uh, it's like an averaging of uh, I think ten models that uh, are. Uh, are we seeing this accuracy like at the end of training for a model, or is this like through training? So so no, this is uh, you know we this is kind of full training. We we kind of measure it full training for computational reasons. I, I mean. Uh, I think the ideal uh, thing would be to also uh, vary, like to to run many many different models of different sizes, uh, etc. But we should, uh, you know, we should at some point do it. It's just more more expensive. I think I mean some of this uh, philosophy of like bits, deep root stuff, etc. Suggests that training time, model size, these, these things can tend to de behave qu quite similarly. Like the you know the, this is very uh, so the data size etc. These uh, resources tend to behave similarly, but this is something that needs to be checked. And so, so another prediction that you could have is that generally, uh, if you so by the way, the way I kind of view it is that maybe like why pre-training. Uh, so maybe what happens right is uh, in learning there is a kind of a simultaneous thing of you learn the manifold, and then you may be doing nearest neighbor on the manifold. And, and, and earlier in training, maybe you're doing more of the learning of the manifold uh, than doing the nearest neighbor. And then you'll have this kind of non-monotonicity, et cetera, where maybe at the time when you're done pre-training, most of what you're doing is captured by type of nearest neighbor type of ideas, and then it's more like uh, the behavior monotone. But this is, again, just speculations. It's not. Yeah, another, another kind of prediction that you might have is that if you're doing nearest neighbor, is that you'll, be, you'll have kind of gradual improvement. So basically, let's don't have to, uh, you know, it's simple calculation, but no need to do it. But generally, uh, what you expect is the following. If, if you had like, uh, you know, uh, probability, I don't know, uh, if, if you had like probability 10% of doing, yeah, above trivial, so, so basically, if, if you got like probability 10% above pre trivial uh, with n samples or n steps and you increased it to, you know, 4n, then it wouldn't suddenly jump. Like you, you don't expect to see these kind of huge jumps uh, because you know, there is a certain smoothness in the probability that you, the right point falls into you, uh, the ball. So um, say if you had a binary task, and uh, and your accuracy was uh, you know it was uh, less than uh, sorry not accuracy advantage over half say uh, was uh, if once you got uh, say w once you got like say uh, if if your advantage over half was uh, say smaller than uh, maybe the way I should have written it was 0 0.1. Anyway, you can do this calculation. But basically, if you have slight advantage over half, uh, you triple the number of points, you, will have, you could have be much better, but not super dramatically better. Yes? But in your, in your analogy, the network is doing k and n, but it's also building this uh, manifold. Right. This could diverge. Yes, yes, that could diverge. But I'm saying, like, so the k and n, I'm, I'm just look, now looking at my analogy was just, uh, you know, not an official model, but I'm just like, trying to see if the k and n model and now what we have seen, I mean, there is this paper, Grokking paper, which I sh intended to put a slide on uh, with that paper, but I uh, didn't get to. Maybe I can blame the internet. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but we, we also have done similar work, where basically what we did was uh, train parities. So the same kind of K parities that we analyzed before. And, you know, if you set K to be the appropriate thing, it's hard for these models, but not impossible. Uh, you know, they, eventually they will get it. But kind of interestingly, uh, when you watch a training run, then um, it, it's often, uh, you know, it, it often kind of drops. This is not log scale. Uh, unlike the walking paper itself, this, this, the x-axis is like his training steps and not in log scale. And you suddenly see kind of a, a, a drop, uh, you know, in uh, this is this would uh, basically uh, error. So you know, error kind of drops from basically having trivial thing uh, error half. You get nothing uh, to get to you get everything. And and this is this kind of behavior is again like not some something that you uh, kind of expect if uh, what you're doing is kind of manifold. And by the way, we also like try to run it in like with different increasing levels of uh, parties and. 
this, these are experiments we still need to run like longer and more, uh, but, but you kind of really see how you, uh, right, the statistical SQ uh, theory would predict it behaves like uh, n to the k or, the, or n to the k over 2, something like, you know, the exponent will grow like, the, uh, like k or k over 2, and you kind of see it in the, as you increase the, you know, inc increase the dimension, this is like 8 parity, 7 parity, 6 parity, you, uh, it, it starts flying very high. Uh, Right, so I think to some extent, I, it's a good question. So you, uh, so so I think you see it more in these kind of combinatorial type of tasks. But maybe one way to define the combinatorial task is a task where you see this behavior. Yeah. So I mean, uh, you could say that maybe in your networks, you know, don't need to. Uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe neural networks don't need to solve problems like parity, etc. But I think you do need them. Like they, they sometimes are sub problems. Uh, to uh, you know, there are some problems that you could have in other things. Like for, you know, for example, when Francis was writing, I think I needed to solve the parity problem on like his M's and N's. <laughs> you know, uh, to di to distinguish between M and N, you seem to need to like uh, when, you know when he, when he writes like uh, you you needed some uh, uh, at least for us non-French people, we needed uh, like uh, to to count the number of uh, lines and see if it's even or odd. Yeah, it could, could be the case. I mean, again, like, I mean, I'm just saying, like, right, right now, yeah, I'm not really offering, like, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not ruling out these things. I'm just saying that, yeah, maybe, I mean, uh, it, it's also pretty clear that if you believe the K and then uh, thing, you, you also have to somehow explain what's going on, how you're learning it, or even maybe not how you're learning it, but uh, when are you learning it, or at least you say, okay, it's magically learned, but somehow it's, it's not magically bo born fully formed, probably, unless you believe in kernels, and then maybe it is. And here is another thing uh, that may be, again, like kernels and nearest neighbors, neighbors, they, they, they don't really lear uh, learn features. And uh, so you might expect that it's harder to uh, say, if I, uh, right, so if I give you, you know, if, so, say, I uh, get you, uh, if I give you a mixture model, uh, and suppose I tell you even which, per, which part of the mixture. So I give you i, uh, x, and uh, like, you know, probability uh, 1 over uh, 10, I, or whatever, you, you know, probability 1 over 10, I give you a, a, a sample from pi, uh, i comma pi, and versus getting just p1. So generally, um, you would think that maybe mixture models should be harder if you, uh, you know, it's better to just, if you're going to be, say, tested on, on P1, it's better to just get all samples from, uh, from P1. Samples from uh, the other things will just be farther away in the manifold and will just be worse for you. Like, they're not going to help you to, uh, you know, to get, uh, to get things that are uh, from a different uh, mixture. But if you're doing feature learning, maybe you're learning some useful features from these things, and maybe these features are even more useful than uh, the features you learn from the actual distribution you'll be tested on. And then here is a, 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 an example. Uh, this is, I, uh, I hope you uh, appreciate it. I uh, ran it on Colab using a hotspot from my phone because the internet wasn't working. <laughs> so, so this is a little too rough. But uh, so I, I, I did the following, uh, the following thing. I uh, considered the following two distributions. So you uh, either you uh, parity distribution, full parity on every uh, on all uh, the bits. So either you take uh, you know x x y or in like more properly it's k comma x comma y I, uh, with a one hot encoding of k. So you get k comma x comma y uh, where you know x is completely random and y is just a parity of all k bits and the other thing is with you select that random point between 1 and k and then you give i comma x comma y where y is the parity of the first i bits and generally if you didn't have like an uh, an architecture that is invariant under permutation then maybe you have a secret hidden permutation where you uh, which uh, in order so, so intuitively, like if you need, if you get like uh, you know 99% success on two should be bet uh, should be 
harder than, in particular would mean you get, kind of have to get 90% on, uh, on the component that corresponds to the first one. So it should be, uh, like in, in some aspects, distribution two should be uh, harder. Um, but what do you think? What will be easier or what will be harder for neural network? I think potentially distribution two might be easier. Yes. Because you see the, e the low i example? Yes. So like somehow so, Right, so, so distribution one, you know, this is, I ran it, and I actually ran it for more, like, uh, and, and, and this is what you get. 50% accuracy, you just get nothing. The, the neural network just K? chokes. What? How big is K? This is what I could do in the collab. I think it was uh, 17 or something, uh, uh, some, some not, or 19, uh, something not very uh, impressive. Uh, and, and, but it's the same K in, in both cases. And then with distribution two, uh, you actually uh, are learning, and I think exactly you're learning in, in this way. Basically, I mean, uh, you are, uh, you know, you get the, f the first parity, it's easy, but then you learn that the first bit is actually important. And then you, uh, you know, you get the, the, the parity of the first, uh, second two bits, and then you kind of learn, and so you progress. And, uh, and I was playing with it, uh, yeah, so there is, this is clearly like feature learning, right? You wouldn't be able, uh, if you were just given, you know, uh, if, if you're just given the task that, uh, you know, of just uh, uh, the parity of on k bits, it's, uh, it's just like, you know, uh, um, you, know, I, I, you, know you take a five-year-old kid and, and get, uh, try to teach them the replica method. That's not going to work out, uh, unless the kid's name is Andrea. Probably he learned it at four, but, uh, you know, <laughs> but uh, generally. Yes, yes. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it's uh, maybe harder to learn it at 40 than it is to learn it at four, uh, <laughs> possibly. Uh, so, uh, so but, but you actually are doing feature learning. So you're giving it kind of like you, uh, it's a mixture model. It's not that I'm giving it in this order. It's completely random, but eventually like the, you know, the, 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 net the network probably is only able to uh, do something interesting with these samples with high I be, uh, after it already learned some interesting features from the low I. So this is a variant of this staircase function. Yes. Which yes, about. yes, exactly. So, so I also did it like, a, so I wanted to do a staircase. So again, this is like, a, this is a mixture model, but it's a, so it's not, but basically I could, get, I wanted to get like a staircase graph like the Hadley. And, uh, and, and here, the way I did it is I wanted to have like the parities kind of jump a little bit more. So the first, uh, uh, yeah, so you know, the first is the parity of the first three bits. Then I think I got it like, I, I think this is not exactly, I think it was like the first three bits, then the first, uh, then, then the second, uh, like zero, one, two, three, four, five. And then, uh, and then at some point I said, okay, the remaining just uh, do it uh, incre increasing by one because I got tired of waiting for the collab and also my uh, uh, mobile plan it was about uh, to run out. <laughs> but, but basically you could see that it's, it really, you, you can generate using these mixtures, you can uh, generate all kinds of uh, uh, staircase type of uh, behavior. And again, like the, you, you, see, you, you have learning really, that uh, uh, feature learning. This was online SDG, uh, the synthetic, right? So yeah, I keep generating and not reusing samples. I, I should say this is, okay, I'm saying I, I, I. The code was uh, uh, Colin Zhang, uh, uh, he gave me the original code, I was just playing with it. He, he, he actually wrote most, uh, the code. Uh, and um, and uh, yeah, and, and we, we had the work, which I thought I would put a slide on. Uh, ah, right, this, this previous, uh, Yes, this, this is a joint work with a bunch of people, but uh, Colin uh, was really uh, driving that project and uh, doing uh, all of these experiments. And uh, yes, and I think we are, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess there is another thing that maybe, uh, we're saying theory of deep learning, and one of the things is that you, it's not even sometimes clear what is, what, are we, what is the thing that we are trying to explain or predict. Like, you know, GPT-3 came and suddenly we have this uh, zero-shot uh, uh, zero learning, et cetera. And it's not, that, uh, it's not as if 
it surprised us because the theory said that uh, the, uh, this should happen at, uh, you know, uh, 300 billion parameters and it happened at 100 billion. The theory doesn't even apply. We didn't even think of asking this question of, uh, right, we, we, we are kind of focused often on, uh, you know, the things that we can model, uh, you can talk about theoretically, which is the, uh, you take the same task uh, and the same distribution or like the distribution that is close in some uh, well-defined metric and, uh, and, com and compare the performance here and the performance there. But uh, often what the things that are most interesting and surprising are things that uh, basically are uh, where, where the tasks are completely uh, different uh, than what has been trained on. And sometimes there you can sometimes see this non-monotone behavior. Like so for example, this is uh, from Diadol, where you can see that uh, this two models could have like, uh, you know, one model could be, uh, you know, much better in terms of uh, log uh, perplexity, but, uh, you know, much... Uh, Can you explain perplexity? What? Could you explain the perplexity and which models were... So this is, a, so this is basically, the, they, they did this uh, survey of like models of, uh, you know, various sizes where basically uh, they, they compared uh, accuracy on a benchmark, which is arguably what you care about more, potentially, with uh, language models, yes. These are language models. And, uh, and uh, with the loss function that you kind of trained on, that, uh, right? So, so the, there is a very nice kind of scaling law with the loss function. As you, uh, you know, as, as you uh, increase the parameters, you get, uh, you know, you get better, uh, you know, you, you, you improve uh, in your, uh, uh, basically, log likelihood. So this is basically like log, uh, you think of it as log likelihood of the next, uh, of the next token. So you, you, you're doing better. So this is very nice scaling load. This is the kind of thing we are used to and think, uh, but then if you actually compare it to what you do on benchmarks, then it behaves somewhat different. <laughs> it's a little bit more of a mess. And sometimes you have this non-monotonicity where this model, these two models there, like this one is kind of one much better than this one in this metric, but is actually you know, worse in this other metric. So you, uh, so you kind of, uh, so, so, so uh, it's, you can have a, like a very nice theory of these kind of capabilities of like this loss function. It might not necessarily translate to uh, explaining what happens when you use it for another task. Right, so this is basically, you take these models and you fine tune them and measure them on some other uh, uh, benchmark. And uh, so, so in some sense we want to explain uh, deep learning. And another question is, what do we explain, right? It's not... Uh, and, and then fine tuned and... and, uh, and it's the same model, right? It's like the same model, you trained it on... And, and then you and then you fine tune it and and, and uh, test it against the benchmark. And the philosophy is that it's supposed to be that the bigger the model, the more you train it, it should be generally better uh, on the benchmark. It just doesn't. I think in the very long view, it does happen, but not necessarily. Uh, Isn't it better on the task that is trained for? Negative log complexity is the metric which it is optimizing, right? Yes. From the point of optimization, it is doing the right thing. Right, right, but uh, this is not what we care about. We don't care about log perplexity. We care about being using it for various uh, benchmarks, right? We, nobody trains, in some sense, you don't train uh, GPT-3 so it could predict the next token of some random text from the internet. That's, that's not what the reason why we, we, we train it. We train it so we could use it for uh, things that are very much off distribution, and tasks that, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, com com uh, completely different, right? So, so in some sense, we, we don't need, want a theory that just explains how it will do on the task it will tra was trained for because that's not what we care about. So, um, so that's kind of another thing that a theory of deep learning in some sense may need to contend with. So, so in some sense, to conclude, uh, in some sense they, they don't really have in some sense grand conclusions. <laughs> Except that we, you know, if we're trying to build the theory of deep learning, we should always be run experiments and, 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 uh, and be aware of experiments because, you know, rea reality can surprise us. So, uh, and, and, and uh, I, you know, some aspects that might be, you know, from statistical point of view could seem like really important might be kind of red herrings where they don't are the main thing, they're not necessarily the main thing. And, 
and I think the, the, the thing that's kind of, uh, uh, that's somewhat confusing is that, you know, the, in deep learning, you often, you, you know, you, like, from some very, from some point of view, you're doing the exact same thing for, uh, you know, for uh, 700 billion steps. You're just iterating gradient descent. So you're doing the exact same thing on, uh, again and again and again, but somehow it seems like uh, that under the hood you're doing many different things. And again, like this is, I don't know if this is true or not, but like this seems to be like that maybe simultaneously, uh, uh, some, but maybe a different, in different uh, measures on both different parts of the network and at different times in the training, you're doing some kind of representation learning where you're learning the manifold, some types of uh, fine tuning of the decision boundary where you're kind of placing things into the manifold and, uh, and, uh, and adjusting it. And then some kind of like, sometimes like this kind of more combinatorial learning, which is maybe, uh, you know, harder and slower and, uh, but does happen uh, also. So, so I think it's, uh, you know, some, some kind of like, uh, maybe more processes. So in some sense there, there is this, grand process that just, you know, re repeating the simple, simple uh, algorithm, but somehow uh, there, there is more than one thing going on uh, at different times of learning and probably maybe even at the same time at different parts of the network and, uh, and on different uh, portions of the probability distribution, especially once you have, you know, real world data that is in some sense maybe more like my mixture model than like uh, the, you know, the classical parity problem, right? So you have examples of different levels of difficulty and that challenge you in different ways. So you might be doing something different on, on uh, and uh, also depending on when, uh, when the network is at the stage that it is ready to receive those examples and ready to do something useful with them. Yes. Um, so for the library you had on the previous slide. Yes. But, but, but in some sense, it's kind of inherent. I think deep learning would not be as successful as it is today, and would, if uh, if it was just good at uh, you know succeeding in the ImageNet competition, right? If uh, you know I the the reason why uh, you know the it's deep learning is changing the world is uh, because empirically uh, it's, su it's successful on things that it has not been trained on, that you take you know, a network pre-trained on ImageNet and use it uh, in uh, self-driving or uh, in all sorts of uh, aspects. So, so this is somehow very, something that's really inherent, like it's not something that we can wash away, uh, kind of ignore and say, ah, okay, we don't need to explain this. If you're, uh, if you're going to uh, use the network on something that was, was trained on, then that's kind of not part of what we care about. Because in some sense, that's the heart of the, why, why deep learning is, uh, right? If, if deep learning, the only thing that it would have been doing is breaking uh, records on the ImageNet competition, where you trained it on ImageNet, you tested it on ImageNet, then, you know, probably we wouldn't be here. It is successful on the samples drawn from same or very close by distributions, right? On distributions which are even slightly far, even adversarially designed deep learning, that's poorly, right? No, it's not. I mean, uh, you know, adversarial is one thing, but, uh, you know, people have pre-training uh, networks on uh, ImageNet and then, uh, you know, fine-tuning them on medical images. They don't look anything like that, and it's still useful, right? Uh, it's kind of amazing that it would be useful for you to pre-train on, uh, right, on, on ImageNet and then uh, that, that it would be, and then use it on something that's, you know... Uh, I don't know. Okay, maybe we can take it off. Yes. I feel like it's a different question. Like somebody who has, let's say, learned every single sport except one, you would expect that person to be better on the last remaining sport, right? Um, yes, but uh, I, I think in some sense what you do with, like with GPT-3 is that, uh, you know, you uh, like set it out to, uh, you know, to, to learn really uh, soccer for uh, football uh, for, for, you know, a huge amount of time and get really good at it and then zero shot uh, have it, uh, you know, uh, uh, win a swimming competition. So, um, so... Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I don't know, but again, like the, the model of a person, right, this is exactly, why do we think, why do we expect a, a person to be good at uh, the remaining sport after they're playing other sports? It's not statistics, it's not like in terms of approximating a function, 
It's more that we believe that the person developed certain skills and representations that are generalizable and extend uh, and can transfer over. In some sense, that's the heart of human learning and maybe that's also the heart of why deep learning is useful. And if it was only useful on the things that it was trained on and on the distribution that it was trained on, it would have been, that, that would not be uh, exciting. Yes? Very sharp, uh, jumping yes. Accuracy. Yes. Well, yeah, two questions related to that. You say you don't see it in images, but do you see it in other? I thought you mentioned at some point this week that in language models. So they have, right? So, so you should have put also. Uh, so they did. Uh, I mean, the language models they showed some kinds of uh, graphs like that. They typically are in log scale, and the x-axis is parameter. And the, 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 because the x-axis is a parameter size, they don't, they don't really try many of those things. So they have like few of them. Uh, but some benchmarks, so there is this big bench paper, which uh, I think it's something like 400 benchmarks on, in, in, on, uh, on, on various language models. And they have noticed that somehow more, I don't know, combinatorial arithmetic type tasks seem to exhibit more uh, of a behavior like that is a little bit more sharp threshold D to some extent than uh, other types of tasks. Uh, so there is this big bench paper, which uh, and, and they do talk about this, like uh, uh, which tasks uh, it seems when you grow the model or make it stronger, the, it jumps up, and which ones it seems like uh, it's more. Uh, yeah, I mean actually, like I think they have more points. I, maybe it wasn't fair. Like I think I was there. There is a, the Google. Uh, one of the large language models where they, they only tried three versions of parameters, but the but the, the big bench I think has like all sorts of models and all sorts of benchmarks, and they seem the the some benchmark seems to exhibit more like of a of a sharper uh, transition. And uh, yeah, it could also be the case that this is kind of skewed. Like even when the parity, you know, we, if uh, we, this is when we look at a single training run, then we we, we see this jump. But the jump, you know, it can occur at a random place. So if you were to average out on, you know, uh, like an, uh, on several training runs and just look at average performance, it would look more, uh, you know, it would look as if it's more smooth. So e e for each particular run, it jumps. On average, uh, it's, it looks more smooth. Yes, <laughs> yes, break. yes, yes. We have a proper break, so thanks a lot of us for the yes. whole series.